Aloha my kako and welcome back to my channel everyone. If you are new to my channel, mahalo for stopping by. I am so excited to be here this evening. I was lucky enough to be invited to attend the IA Orchid Club monthly meeting where their guest speaker for the evening is none other than Roy Tokunaga of H&R Nurseries. And some of you might recognize his name right away, but for those of you who don't, Roy has been growing orchids for over 50 years and is one of the world's great orchid hybridizers. So I feel very honored and privileged to be here this evening to be able to listen and learn from a very experienced and knowledgeable orchid grower. And he gave me permission to record his educational speech so that I could share it with all of you here on my YouTube channel. So I hope you guys enjoy and learn something from this amazing orchid grower. After graduating from Baldwin, our speaker attended the, the University of Hawaii, where he received a bachelor's degree in education. His goal was to teach biology in high school. Fortunately for the orchid world, he never got a chance to teach. He was recruited by Ernest Iwanaga to start an orchid lab. He spent his first seven years after graduating from UH cloning and germinating orchids. In 1981, he left Ernest Yonaga to start another working lab in Guantanamo with Harry Kakagi. Harry and Roy eventually became partners to form H&R Nurseries. Our speaker is an accredited judge of the American Orchid Society and an honorary judge of the Honolulu Orchid Society. He has been hybridizing orchids for more than 40 years with several thousand hybrids delivered. Most of his work has been in the Dendronia and Cavalier Alliance. Tonight, our speaker will speak on this catch of the day. Without further ado, please welcome Roy. Uh, thank you for that beautiful introduction. Not too many people know that I grew up on Maui and sparkles there. <laughs> and um, now it's just a king field. So how times have changed. But one of the things that, um, <clears throat> that goes through well, my career is that I love to teach. So you've got to have a biology lesson today. So one of the things I was known for is putting my students to sleep within the first 10 minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to work hard and I'm trying to keep you awake. OK, first of all, I have some little magazines from the American Orchid Society up front, so you can take a look. If you want to borrow it, you're welcome to just take it. And what you're going to do is, when you get tired of it, or if you like it, you like it, just keep it forever. When you get tired of it, just bring it back to the meeting and leave it up front so somebody else can take a look at it. Uh, I used to collect these things, but my wife got tired of my collection. So I'm, the classification is I'm a hoarder. <laughs> so I've been hoarding too many of these. So I'm trying to share it. I can't get rid of it. I can't throw it away. But don't give it back to me. <laughs> OK, so you can help yourself. So I've given a talk that has a vague title, like Catch of the Day, which I talk about some of the plants that are blooming in that particular time frame. So what I wanted to do was um, not only bring some of the plants, but show you some of the changes I've made. I've been growing orchids for 50 years. There was always a problem. When I grew orchids in Malolo, up in the valley, it's called Carlos Long area, which is close to Cabo orchids, if you know what that is. I was a good grower, even though I had grown orchids only for two years. Everything grew really easily. When I worked for e &R Orchids, they're sitting right next to Kawamoto Nursery in Palo Valley. That's way up in the valley. <clears throat> I also was the grower for e &R Orchids, and orchids were so easy to grow. Then 1980, 
79, I moved to Hawaii Kai for my home. Every plant I brought home, I just could not grow. So I just stopped growing plants at home. That always bothered me. When I used to talk to some of my good friends, especially Richard Takafuji in Waina, he would always bring this topic up. Why is it that some people can grow their orchids so well, others struggle? Next time we meet, don't you notice that people from certain areas always have the nicest orchids? Why? I'm one of those curious types, so I try all kinds of experiments to try and figure it out. 10 years, 20 years later, 30 years later, I'm growing now three acres of orchids. But three acres of orchids growing okay, which isn't good, which isn't excellent, is not the best way to grow three acres of orchids. I knew there was something wrong. I tried everything. I studied, did research, tried to find another nursery as close as possible to mine. But even nurseries in Waianae seem to be able to grow orchids just as well or better than my nursery in Waimanalo. But I noticed that Orchid Center, being deep in Waianae Valley, was the best of the growers, and as you moved toward the ocean, just a couple miles, the plants started to look not so good. I won't name names, but they looked like my plants in Waimanawa. Okay, so the question was, what was wrong with my nursery in Waimanawa at sea level? Actually, we're 21 feet in elevation, 40 inches of rain a year, and growers that were one mile closer to the mountain could outgrow me by a mile. There was no information that I could use, so I, it was in the back of my mind, I tried all kinds of experiments, watered the plants more often. Finally, a grower from California came and he said, you cannot grow orchids in a greenhouse. Not a greenhouse, a shade house. I have a shade house. Every one in Hawaii grows in a shade house, even if it's covered. It's classified as a shade house <clears throat> because it's not totally controlled. Greenhouses are totally controlled. So on the mainland, they will run humidifiers, they will control the temperature, they will run fans, a good air movement 24 7. In a shade house, which is passive like ours, whatever the humidity is, it is. So I started to suspect that one of the things that's really different in my nursery is that my humidity tends to be very low 24-7. Now try and quantify it to, sh to show what it does to the orchid and how you would try and counter that problem. Another 10, 20 years, so now after 50 years I'm in my 48 years, so only about 10 years ago, I started to really focus on water. Okay, the point I'm trying to make is that it's not easy to see. It's not something simple that, and it's not something you can even read about. When you start to grow orchids in an environment that is not like where they came from or evolved, you start to have problems and you can start making a list. One of which is that if the humidity is low, you just have to stop and visualize mentally what's happening in the root zone. So the, the plants we love actually can do this. I've seen orchids, all kinds of orchids, they put it on a piece of wood. This is just on a tiny piece of bark that you can buy it. Nothing else, no media. I tried to do this 
for 40 years and could not grow them very well. I could grow them, but not like this. Only in the last five years. And what changed is I started to use rainwater. I didn't have enough, so I started to use reverse osmosis water, which is just like rainwater. Okay, so now to characterize the problem, <clears throat> I started to think that, okay, since there's nothing written on it, there's no tables to follow, there's nothing you can really do, except really look at it hard in the physics of this, in that any amount of outside, what we call them salts, like sodium chloride and fertilizer salts, that is applied to this plant, well, as soon as it dries up, it gets stuck to the outer surface of the roots. Okay, so my water um, in, let's say, Hawaii Kai, is different from the water from central Oahu, is different from Waimanalo. I know that because, let's see, what do they do with my... They sell really cheap pH, uh, pH and, uh, uh, well, parts per million meters. TD, they call it TDS, total dissolved salt meters. Uh, this one was um, from Amazon, $12. I get it prime, so you don't pay for freight. So I've been monitoring my total dissolved salts. And I know that in Waimanawa, when I first started to grow orchids in 81, it was the water was 70 parts per million coming out of the tap. In Waimanalo, it's been ranging from 160 to 200. Okay, as of two weeks ago when I did a test, it's 160 in Waimanalo, but 212 in Hawaii Kai. Okay, so I blame the uh, shutting down the halava shaft for that. <laughs> it went from like 170, kept going up, now it's 212, so. I hope they, they don't activate too many more brackish wells. Okay, so what happens? Every time you water, if this dries out, the salts get left behind. If you're in a very humid area, you don't water as often, so you don't need that many water salts on the plant. Also, if you have it outside, it rains more if you're in a wet area. The other problem I have is that because the humidity is so low, this dries out so fast that I have to water twice a day. Okay, so my estimation is that someone growing in a wet area, like if I were in deep in Palolo Valley, Wahiwa, Tunia, or even Mililani, if you were growing out in the rain, this plant would be leached all the time. Even if you grow it under complete cover, your humidity is high enough that as long as you didn't water twice a day, the plant is going to do really well. Okay, so that's the biggest difference. I estimated that my salt buildup on my plants in my area is a, might be 10 times worse than, let's say, someone in, let's say, Mililani. Okay, so the variables are a lot, like for example, a lot of people who grow, let's say, Aea Heights, Mililani, they're growing in the cover. Okay, so what happens is that um, they may, the plant may not get, ever get flushed by the free rain. Okay, so when I was growing with rainwater with limited amounts, I, the plants I tested turned around and started to grow a lot better. Okay, now I have reverse osmosis water, I can grow a lot more plants, much more effectively, and pretty soon they're all under reverse osmosis. There's no comparison between plants growing in the general nursery, in Waimanawa, in my nursery. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing I wanted to define was where are the bad areas? Okay, so if you're far away from the mountain, close to the ocean, that's bad. But, if you're in Kaneohe, because the mountain is higher there, the humidity is much higher, even down to sea level. Okay, so... In fact, even parts of Kailua, if 
you're in the right place at a higher humidity. You, you could drive from one place to the next and you can see it immediately. The orchids that we love can also, if the temperature drops at night, as you go up in elevation, you get a drop in temperature and you actually have morning dew. But it seems like 500 to 1,000 feet is the best elevation to be to get that effect. Which means the plant can actually pick up water in the morning that's coming straight out of the air. It's condensing. Okay, so my conclusion is that for those in bad areas like Hawaii Kai, Kahala is a really, really bad area. So move out of there. <laughs> um, how many people from Kahala? Nobody from Kahala? No problem. Kaiwuki? Hawaii Kai? <laughs> Okay, if you're near Pearl Harbor, down sea level, that's pretty bad. Anybody in that area? Waipahu? Nobody in Waipahu? I think. Yeah, that's a tough place, Waipahu. You're just like my place. Eva? Eva Plains? Kapolei? That's me. Okay, so this talk is for you. Okay, what I had to do was I couldn't, I did a, what is called a Wilbur Chang watering. In other words, you just don't just water once. I would water my plants. This is what I do at home. Then I'll come back and water it again. My best plants in my nursery actually got three. I would water, come back, water. Before it's dry again, come back and water. That's a lot of water. Okay? It's a lot of labor too if you're doing it by hand. I, I tried doing it with sprinklers and it can be done, but that's a real large quantity of water. But what I found out is that reverse osmosis took me to a new level. The best I could do with all that extra watering was I, some of my plants were in the good range instead of being just okay. See, that's the bit where it's tough. So. I can still sell plants that are okay, but it's hard to compete with, let's say, Milwaukee, who grows this plant so nice, or Calvin Kumano. In fact, my phalaenopsis were so bad, I stopped growing phalaenopsis years ago. Okay, but... And you grow it in why not? That I can't figure out. Well, one day, I'm going to ask you to get a water sample from Orchid Center. And we'll, we'll do a TDS on it. Richard always told me his water was the best on a walk. A different well? Yeah, that's what he said. Yeah. Okay. But is it worse or is it? Are you having trouble growing anything? No, uh, not really, but you know when you drink the uh, ice water, the water... Well, I don't care what it tastes like. It tastes like <laughs> <laughs> I'm more concerned about what the orchids say. <laughs> okay. So, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pass out a bunch of these. So, not everyone can get a plant, but you can have to share it for now.
Okay, so what I'm trying to show is that you have to look at it really carefully. Um, I could grow this grass of all Moldosa quite well. I've been growing it since uh, the 70s. The problem is that I always saw other people growing it better. If I were to put the plant in a denser pot, I could get it to grow quite well in the past. What I couldn't do was grow the Brassavola and Lodosa in air. It's like literally growing in nothing. So the difference between growing something in a pot and growing something with bare roots, okay, the, the, the skill level required is much higher and that's what I couldn't do, okay? I, two and a half, three acres of orchids, but they all have to be in pots. But every time I tried to mount a plant, I couldn't grow it that well. Okay, so if I were to set up a theory, you know, in science, you, you get an idea and say, okay, let's set up a theory of what might be happening. And so I'm focusing now on salt accumulation. So what can you do to get the plant, the orchid plant, back to as close as you can to where it comes from in nature. So just got to visualize up in the mountains. Okay, so how much fertilizer do they get up in the mountains? Okay, near zero. Unless a bird comes flying by. How much, what kind of water is getting up in the mountains? It's about as pure as you can get. It's coming out of the clouds, it's rainwater. Okay, so that's number one. We're not giving our plants rainwater. But if you can't get enough rainwater, what else can you use and what is available today that wasn't 20 years ago easily is reverse osmosis water. I've traveled all over the country and I have it in my notes. I just didn't ask the right questions. I have to go back and ask some of the better growers. Do you know all of the good growers in California use reverse osmosis. Okay, any of you bought plants from Andy's orchids? He's a fantastic grower. Or um, Sunset Valley orchids. No? Very few people import plants, but fantastic grower. He gives talks. I've sat in his talk many times and I've told him, you know, he, he didn't mention the fact that he only uses reverse osmosis water in San Diego. You can't use anything else. You'll kill the plants. That's what he's told me, but he won't tell the audience. Okay, so you go figure it out. So I kept fact on two times. You really so, need to tell your customers and the people you're talking to because he has fantastic plants. Reverse osmosis. But instead, it talks about fertilizer, drying the plants out severely, and so forth. Okay, so all over the country, certain genera, so Paphipedalum, Mazzavalias, Frags, Fragmentidiums, they're the most sensitive to the salt problem. So, this Brassavola that I'm showing is one of the most tolerant of salt. Okay, so to grow it from okay to excellent, which I've been doing lately, is because I'm paying attention to it. But most people would not see it, that I know. Okay, so what's the problem with the salts? There are some types of plants that I could, I did a lot of hybridizing with this type of dendrobium. Okay, this is called Don Marie. I could never keep this plant healthy. I've been hybridizing with it since 1980. But every one of my Don Marie's was very near death. Sometimes I put too many seed pods on it, they would just die. And, but it was a critical breeding plant for, for some of the crosses that I made over and over again. Okay, so the best plants I had grew in almost nothing. 
but sustaining it was extremely difficult. So every year I had to practically repot the plant, which really stresses the plant, and never could get a healthy plant no matter what I did. But in the last five years, with just rainwater and reverse osmosis water, I can start redoing and rethinking how I grow some of my orchids. Um, the problem is this is a really small root system, so you can, and it's all exposed to air. So any amount of excess salts that's not like the rainwater will hurt this plant. And because it's just sitting there hanging, it needs to be watered several times a day. Okay, and I do it with pure water, and there's no problem. If I do it with my city water, uh, I slowly kill the plant. But it takes several years. Okay, so when I had a plant like this, and I start to give it the pure water, it took one to two years to really get the plant to a point where I thought they were really nice. It's so gradual that most of you won't see it. Okay, so up to this point, any questions? Okay, so, yes? I thought the majority of the salts that you put up on the orchids was from the use of fertilizer, not so much from the water. I always thought that we had some of the finest water in the United States. I was kind of surprised when you mentioned the, the level of solids in, in our water. Yes. One of the things that we had to do more than anything was to flush the roots to get out the salts to build up from the fertilizer. Yes, and you can grow your orchids quite well. I, I, I did it for 40 years that way. So I'm not saying you can't grow orchids using the city water. So did you change the type of fertilizer that you used so that there was a less salt in the um, I use one tenth the amount of fertilizer I used to use now. In concentration? Both. Okay, so his question was, uh, isn't most of the salts coming from fertilizer? In other words, if the salt buildup is self-inflicted. And the answer is yes, a lot of the salts are coming from fertilizer. Number two is, isn't our water good? Yes, that's what I was told and I believed it too. And I would have to agree that our water is good. Waikai, even at 211 parts per million, that's considered good water. That's why I overlooked it for at least 30 years. I didn't think the water was a problem. But if you humidity, orchids come from areas where humidity is constant 24-7 at 70%. Can you give that to your orchid? And the answer is no. As soon as you put plastic cover over it, your humidity is going to be low. Okay, if you live in Hawaii Kai, your humidity is low. If you live up in the mountain, the air coming through is perfect. So location is so important. So what I'm talking about now is what do you do if you're in the bad place? So I estimated that my low humidity and high temperatures in my nursery, you may have to have a multiplier of 10. In other words, if your water is running at 160 parts per million, in my place, it's 1,600. That's how you have to look at it. Versus, if you're up in Aia Heights, or 400 or 500 feet up in Aia, the, the air is actually rolling down the mountain. So you're getting air from 1,200 feet or more rolling down the mountain, which kind of disappears around, hard to say. Uh, my, I used to visit Robert Oki, so you could tell that his air was much better, but I don't know what elevation Robert Oki was at. So I wouldn't be surprised if you found that um, Eddie Wong's place or the Okas, the rural Okas, location was very good. But if you went higher up, it would be even better. Okay, but 
many people like me, I'm stuck in Hawaii Kai, and I like Hawaii Kai, and I'm not going to move out of Hawaii Kai for my orchids. Okay, so what I'm going to try and give you is some hints as how to get better at growing in your bad areas. Yes? So, uh, have you brought our water to Hawaii Kai? Okay, the question is, have I gone, taken the step to grow orchids in Hawaii Kai with the reverse osmosis I have, which I could easily transfer the, the, the unit back home once in a while to get some water? And the, the question is no. And this is the reason why. Thanks to COVID, I, I'm home a lot, much more than I ever was. I can pay more attention to my orchids at home I really wanted to figure out, is there a way, using my city water, very little rain, to grow a decent orchid in Hawaii Kai? And essentially, it's a Wuba Chai watering. So you have to water once, twice, three times. Then I try to get by as many days as possible. In the summer, I'm doing it daily. But I was working long hours. They were not going to get watered. Because I would leave the house when it's dark, come home when it's dark, and I'm tired. I'm not going to go water my plants three times because I can't even see them. Okay, you have to be realistic. But with COVID, I'm at home. So I water the plants. And yes, you can. And I noticed that um, I chose to fer under fertilize them on purpose just to see how well I could grow them. And yes, you can grow a really nice plant, even though it's pretty under fertilized. You don't have to be commercial grade A. Okay, to answer your question, yes, I can grow the dendrobiums, the nodosa types. Uh, one of my nodosas at home is four feet across, growing into a bench, into the ground, so it'll never show up in any show. I put a few on my trees, growing them on trees now. I couldn't do that before because I just didn't water them enough. Okay, so it can be done. But now, if you're gonna grow, Kate grows Paphiopedalums and Phragmopediums. These are, are the ultra purists. They really hate any of the salts in, in the media. So I think in the past, I can list all the plants I killed very quickly or did not do well with in the past. And it was all because of the water. Because in the last five years, as I'm using more and more of the pure reverse osmosis water, but few survivors I had of some of these poor plants that just couldn't thrive in. I thought it was, I was too warm at too low an elevation. But once you start thinking of like that, you don't work to solve the issue. But it turns out water allowed me to grow maybe 80% of all the plants that I struggled with. Also, in my nursery, I realized that I didn't have to fertilize so much, so I kept backing off. So my total fertilizer use now is approximately a one tenth of what I used to give to grow an okay plant. So if someone were to ask me, didn't you ever try cutting back? And I say, yes, when I cut back, the plant would totally starved. Okay, so if you think about it, what happens is that if this root system, fully exposed to air, starts to accumulate various water salts that don't leach out very easily, you reach a certain point where when you fertilize, the plant can't get the fertilizer very well. There's too much competition. So we got into this really bad rut of fertilizing more and more. And I was within the range of some of the most aggressive fertilizer people. And then we had to irrigate longer and longer. Okay, so, well, it went like this. We would irrigate 10 to 12 minutes, flood the whole place. Then I could fertilize for three minutes. But before I could fertilize again, I had to flood the whole place for 10 to 12 minutes. Okay, then I could fertilize again. So 
all the fertilizer now is in the ground. Tons of it. So when I do my RO, I will flush the plants, finish with RO. Then in a 250-gallon tank, I'll tank mix my fertilizer, pH adjusted. I can add six things in there, dilute each one separately, one at a time, and they won't precipitate. In the concentrate, when I had injectors, you couldn't put certain things together. So there are three things that were incompatible with each other, but once they're diluted and the pH is adjusted down, I can shoot five fertilizer components all at the same time. Then I'm following guidelines from big nurseries, like on the mainland, where they say, you know, you use um, 200 parts per million nitrogen, so you have to run the calculation and it comes out to one teaspoon per gallon. And they do it constant feed. That's why it's written. So I had to email the, read, the, the person who wrote that and said, what was the frequency? And this was Matsui Nursery in Salinas, and it's a 40 acre range, which I visited three times. Fantastic, all the plants are really nicely grown. He said, oh yeah, by the way, it's, uh, they only do it once every three weeks. Okay, so one teaspoon per gallon of the fertilizer, they're using triple 18, but they would apply it enough so that 10, 20% fell off the bottom once every three weeks. In other words, no other water. Can you get by water and wait three weeks? Okay, in a shade house, you cannot. Most shade housing, especially if I'm super hot, I'm a factor of 10 compared to maybe some of the other growers here as far as evaporation. So what it means is that if you can humidify your environment to a point where you can water the plants once and you don't have to water again for three weeks, you have the right humidity. So my estimate is almost no one here has that environment. I, I would be really surprised. Unless you, I'm not talking about in the rain now, under cover. There are some lucky people that throw everything in the rain and it grows like crazy. Okay, so when you're in the rain, the biggest danger to any plant in the rain is water logging, too much water. Okay, and so again, you look up in the mountains and think about an orchid sitting up there where they came from. How many were growing in plastic pots? <laughs> okay, how many got fertilized by humans up in the mountains? So you get an idea how much we've taken the orchids away from what they're adapted to. Can they use fertilizer? The answer is yes. Okay, and, but what they really would like is a very pristine environment for the root system. To grow nodosa well in a plastic pot like this, because the plant really would rather be growing in open air, you know, we modify this thing so I brought it along to show you that we're using a two inch net pot for the media and inserting the plant into a solid plastic, it's a hybrid. So in other words, by doing that, we give the roots enough air, they can't waterlog even if it rains three days, five days, three weeks in a row. Okay, there's enough oxygen there and it, you can't overwater a plant like this. And that's how we, why we started to do things like that. <clears throat> Any questions up there? That was a good question. Kate grows frags and fragmentarium, so they invested in a big RO system. So every once in a while she brings out and shows off her paths and frags. And I'm really jealous because years ago I put a lot of effort into trying to grow paths and frags. 
I had a budget of about ten thousand dollars. We diverted to that project, and I slowly killed them all. Like they don't die overnight. You watch them slowly die over two, three years, and crown rot, bacteria, and fungus is what seems to take them out. So you're blaming bacteria and fungus, but clueless as to what the real reason was. I had a few paths. And the frag you gave me, oh, they're doing fine. They bloomed again. So everybody here has frags now because they got some last month. <laughs> okay, so you can find some rainwater. That's where you would really divert it to the, those kind of plants. Okay, so in the beginning, I only had 100 gallons a day, so I was have to be very careful who, who got reverse osmosis water. Just to run the experiment to confirm that that was the problem. There are people in really good growing areas and they only have plants now that grow well for them. That if you were to apply all the water to it, so Mel is running that experiment and he keeps reporting back to me, I can't see anything. Mel is in such a good area that he used all the water and the plants are still growing about the same. That's what I suspect. It's, everything's going good. So. So if you really want to go into a really good growing area, check where Mel lives. Look for real estate in that neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, that's why you really want to have your orchids. Okay, so any questions after that? Okay, um, I guess I'll tell you who's going to get the plant. So um, let's see, who's the oldest here? Really, uh, Want to support the oldest that we have here. Who's who's more than ninety years old? <laughs> no ninety. <laughs> oh, you get one plant. So grab any plant you want. So who's next to you? Okay, how about eighty-five and above? <laughs> Grab one, find a plant. Yeah, take one the plant. You may have to run across somebody else's table. Grab a plant. My, my wife normally helps, helps me with the sales, so she wanted to let you all know that she missed seeing all of you. She had to rush back to Maui because her mom fell. She's a hundred, one and a half. No, one hundred and a half. Okay, so we're trying to do everything we can to keep her healthy. How about eighty and above? <laughs> Bill, you didn't raise your hand. You're not ninety. <laughs> yeah, so you should have gotten one by now. How many plants left can you raise? Okay. What was the last? 80 and, 80 and above? There's a, you're missing some 80 year olds here. 80 and above? Anybody not have a plant? <laughs> Don't want to miss anybody. Because I have some extras. <laughs> Okay, 79, 78, 78, how many have one left? Okay, did I miss anyone? I have an extra plant here, so. Okay, so what you're going to see on that plant is a beautiful root, live roots, many of them three or four years old. In the past, I would have a plant throw a root, but in one or two years it will die, and then another root would take its place, but never could keep it sustained. Okay, that's the difference. But you have a healthier plant if, if it's sustained. So it's growing very much like a vanda. 
Okay, when the lights go out, the breath of all no dosa becomes fragrant. Okay, so just a quick summary. Look, all I'm saying is you gotta do everything you can to keep the salt levels in your plant as low as possible. So which means if you can grow in the rain, there's an advantage. But you have to make it so that the plants don't waterlock, then you can grow in the rain. Okay, and if you water water thoroughly, you get the salts to come out, then that way it doesn't start to accumulate. If you can adapt with water water supply, I've been encouraging people to collect rainwater from the gutters and use it on your plants, but instead of throwing it on your lawn and on any other plant, just reserve it for your orchids. And they have small pumps that you can throw in, a, in the... Well, actually, at, even at my nursery, I have a, a 50 gallon container and I save gallon bottles and I just dunk it in there and give some of the plants nearby extra reverse osmosis water. That's how I water uh, this plant. There's a gallon of oral sitting next to it. I don't have to get the hose with the RO. I can just stick my gallon and water the plants. So I can, every time I'm out there, oh, you need water. Sometimes three times a day, four times a day, sometimes once a day, sometimes nothing because I don't go out. But anyway, you can grow in the rain if you give enough drainage, air. There's different ways to do it. So I showed you one where you grow the plant in a net pot, which is easy to find nowadays. So all the meat is in the net pot. You slip it into a <coughs> paper pot, a plastic pot. Then the plastic pot holds more of the moisture because I'm in a dry area, remember? But if you're in a really super wet area, you, you don't want this plastic pot. Okay, so one of the experiments I ran, um, the giveaway tonight is going to be a Gramatophyllum scriptum that always blooms in uh, May, June. It'll all, about 50% of the time, it'll be in full bloom for the AEA show, providing it, it's the same time in June. Okay, Gramatophyllum. So this is a Gramatophyllum scriptum. In this plant, the last time it had media, it was in a two-inch pot. Okay. I, I always grew this really well. But I wanted to see what would happen if I gave the plant only reverse osmosis water. And the answer was, yeah, you get a much better plant. We're, we're a really fantastic uh, root system. So in other words, the, uh, the media for the gramatophile is the roots. Okay. Um, for this time of the year, a catch of the day, well, this is Brasabola cordata from Jamaica. And I crossed it to this Brasabola nodosa, um, which comes from Mexico, Central America, South America, and many of the Caribbean islands, a huge area. So you cross the two, and it makes little stars. So many of you are familiar with little stars. It, this, this was growing in my yard and I just yanked the plant a piece of it to show you what it looks like. Okay, so, parents. Um, remember I told you I had a nodosa in my yard, four feet across? It's in full bloom. Sometimes I get about a hundred spikes. Um, I used to cut this, the flower spike, put it in water, it doesn't hold very long. But if you cut the cane at the base, well, the plant isn't going to grow anywhere, and it's, so I just go in and cut, and then you put it in a vase, you can make flower arrangements. <laughs> you know, and that's how I bring it into the house, otherwise the plant is outdoors and never go into the house, and you can learn how to make flower arrangements. Dendrobium stradiotis usually blooms for June. Sure, you know, I yeah, sure. So good to have some of these if you can find it. But the plant is stuck in my yard 
to a rock and a ground. I'm never going to leave that spot. So what I do is, from time to time, I just get the cane. The complaint, people would tell me, the spike is too short, you cut it right there. How in the world are you going to make a, any kind of arrangement with it? Well, just take a piece of it. And now it's part of the flower arrangement. Another species related to Stratiotis, this is called the Poria. Um, I just got, got it in the last uh, 15 years and been studying it. It blooms year round. So it's closely allied. So simple cross across the Liporium with Stratiotis. So hopefully some people got it and they'll share it with everybody. And um, the Liporium blooms almost continuously like the Antenata. Okay, and the, uh, we, we used to call them um, antelope type dendrobiums because the flowers have curls and like an antelope horns. And the problem with this group is they get tall. Okay, both of the parents of this hybrid, which is called Great Scott um, Marbillianum by uh, this color, both of them can go past six feet. So. This plant just happened to be in bloom. I cut it and I made a note as to where I cut it. It was my eye level. So from the ground, in growing in full sunlight, what do you do with a plant like this? So I make the cut at about eye level so I have a little part of the bulb with me and it becomes part of the flower arrangement. Okay, just wanted to show you what to do with plants that don't want to behave. <laughs> also, the flower spikes are not quite suitable for making flower arrangements. So all of my laturias, I used to bring uh, laturias like this. Oh, by the way, I named this after myself, so. And I've been trying to change the color, so. It's a very unusual color form, just having to bloom, so I brought it. But anyway, so my mother-in-law, who I used to give a lot of these to on Maui, kept saying, no good. The flower sp spike is too short. Can't put it in the vase on the altar. Okay, so the solution was to just cut the cane you want, okay, and put it into the uh, flower arrangement. So, all you have to do <laughs> So I, I would make beautiful arrangements for her with these luxurious in different colors. And I found that if you cut it with the cane, the flower spike will last three weeks or more. It's like cut flowers, you still have to recut it from time to time, keep it clean. If it gets a little stinky or you have to wash it, change the water, recut, and it'll keep on growing. So plants that didn't have as much of a spike to begin with, others cannot pick up water. Like this nodosa, I think, the, the stem cannot pick up water. So, make an arrangement and it just comes out right away. So that's how you, I, I also use plants that get too big. So many Laturias I had would be huge. Like I had a number that would have like 30, 40, and 50 spikes like this. Plants are not very big. They're a little bigger than this plant here, taller, physically. And I would have huge number of spikes. But not one of them useful for an altar, so I would just cut it for her. I used to take about 50 or 60 cuttings from my nursery for her and make arrangements for her in on Maui. Okay, so that's another way to use your plant. So you can do it with all the orchids. Um, Catleas too, so I think someone bought the community park there. Do you see the, can you lift it up? Yeah, just grab the stand. I stuck it in there. It's uh, Yes? <laughs> that, that's, that plant you bought, okay? 
didn't want you to think that it's blooming already <laughs> in the community park. But many times I'll take my cafes and cut the canes and, and use them for arrangements and they last a lot longer. Okay, any questions? So, the summary. All I know is when you teach a class, you're only going to remember one, maybe two things. So, first, try and use rainwater if you can. Okay, a lot of people have dark spots. You can cut it, find someone, hire a plumber. I want that rainwater for my orchids. And you collect it and store it, especially during the uh, rainy season. Number two is when you water, you water three times lightly. Let the water go through. Yes? I was at a class at the, I think it was Urban Garden, and they said when you water catchment, that water is no good because it's full of chemicals from your roofing. And yes, that's true. So, what most people used to do was not use the first, if it didn't rain for a long time, they would discard the first rainfall and then use that after that. But you're not going to drink it though, okay, so it's for your orchids. They don't put it on vegetables. Yes, so the stuff that comes off the roof is good for the orchids. Okay, so in Waimanalo, we get a lot of salt spray. So it didn't rain for a long time, so rain through the gutter, so I get my TDS meter, that's why it's important. Can I use that water? And it's mostly sodium chloride. And so the first 50 gallons I got uh, was 200 parts per million, so I had to dump it. I already used city water. Versus what came off the roof is probably just sodium chloride. Okay, so I had to wait for the next rainfall. So I dumped the water, wait for the next rainfall, and then of course it goes way down. So what you want is something in the neighborhood of 50 parts per million. Okay, so there's nurseries all over the, the country that I've gone to, and they have different uh, ways to address the same problem, and it's the salt building. And always turn, it was something that was so hard to get numbers on. Okay, so for example, in Santa Barbara, the water is very hard. Okay, so the growers there, told me they, uh, their average irrigation is 45 minutes. And so it just runs for 45 minutes and no spritzing in between. Okay, but because they have wet pads that humidifies the greenhouse, they don't have to water again for three weeks. Okay, so a lot of times they'll apply the fertilizer right after the, uh, the, the flushing. I also came across really good growers in, in Florida. The two best growers in, in South Southern Florida. They finally confided with me that they run their irrigation one hour. But they're using well water and it's very hard. So they, not only that, during the uh, wet summer months, they have wet summers in Florida. They take the plastic off. And the plastic just comes back for the winter. Okay, so what do they all have in common? Yes, they're flushing the plants with extreme amounts of water. Okay, so I propose at H&R that we increase our irrigation to 20 minutes and it was voted down. I'm already flooding the whole place with 10 minutes. So to do it even longer was not feasible. I just got numbers from Calvin not too long ago, a couple of years ago. Orchid Center, considered one of the best growers. His timer? 12 minutes. Yeah, his timer was set for 12 minutes. But I remember Richard would tell me things like that. That's all it would run. In other words, no spritzing. It would just run 12 minutes, then wait a couple of days. It'll go as many days as necessary, then he'll run it again. And what was interesting, he had fertilizer in there. So he ran 12 minutes of fertilizer. So for those who remember Orchid Center, in the old days, it was full of algae. And um, 
the, uh, I know some of the numbers of up the amounts of fertilizer he was using. It was like three diets in one greenhouse per week if he ran three irrigations. A lot of fertilizer. Okay? Right now, I am using 200 parts per million applied once by hand with our water. Because my humidity is so low, I had to improvise. So instead of running irrigation again through sprinklers, I use RO and I lightly water the plants to rehydrate them. Okay, that's the best I can do to keep humidity up. But there's no salts being added to it. So the RO is running at 15 parts per million. So 10 applications of RO equals one city water. And it turns out that I can just rehydrate the plant. And the reason I re just rehydrate, I don't want to flush the fertilizer out. So I'm doing exactly what Matsui is doing. One fertilizer, three weeks, 200 parts per million. Okay, that's about one teaspoon. Is that close to what some of you are growing in your backyard? Okay, so in my home, I'm going at the rate of one teaspoon per gallon every other month. And the plants actually look pretty good, so I'm just hanging around that. Okay, it's really different from what I used to fertilize before. Okay, so what did I do before? One, religiously, one teaspoon per gallon every week. And the plants were okay, but not the best. And you know, it was just nothing consistent. In other words, the plants would have disease problems and I wouldn't know why. The plants wouldn't flower, I wouldn't know why. The plants couldn't throw good roots and I didn't know why. Now it's very consistent. Good roots, beautiful plants. They're telling me that they're much happier, they're closer to what it's like in the jungles where they came from. Yes, Kate? Are you still using stem or Okay, the question is, am I using micronutrients? Uh, that's one thing I didn't back off from, but it, the proportion is still there. So in other words, when I cut the fertilizer down to one-tenth, my use of micronutrients went down by you know, 90% too. It's in proportion. That didn't change, but it didn't seem like necessary to get more. Okay, so... If you want to know the NPK, I'm using, most of the summer, I'm using triple 20. But October comes along, I switch to 13 to 13. Okay. If I have mature plants that don't want to flower, uh, I make it a point to not give them very much of the triple 20. The triple 20 will give you your most beautiful plants, but many times, um, the dendrobiums especially will cancel their flowering. It may take up to two years to get the plant to go back on cycle. There's, it's, there's a long explanation for that, but I figured out what causes that. And uh, it's just that ammonia and urea are very potent fertilizers. Very, the plants just love it. And they'll switch to a vegetative state. Okay, so just have to be careful. So I'm, right now, I'm really trying to be careful to tell people what I really use. Okay, so if I were to, my yard, I've been experimenting with Nutrico, a small amount of Nutrico, and that seems to be the best fertilizer overall. Fair enough. So a four inch pot plant, or a plant about this size, would get five kernels for the year. No more. Okay, and I do give extra microbes and I'm giving separately, the trouble is once in a while I have to give some calcium nitrate and I'm giving magnesium sulfate, that's Epsom salts. Okay, that's when you want to grow orchids to a level where you can bring it to the IES show and win the trophy. <laughs> okay, I'm just competitive, so. Okay, also I want people to start growing more of the these gorillaphiles and they take full sunlight, five, six hours. 
Yeah, I took one of my clients home. Um, it's pretty big because it gets any bigger and I can't carry it anymore. Okay, so in 2021, I had 46 bikes in my front yard getting six hours of full sunlight. I was tempted to let some people know that you can drive by. Just to take a look at it. So now I only have photographs of it. So. Last year I had four spikes. And the reason is I didn't take that much care of it. Like I wanted to find out if I could let it go through the summer without watering it. The answer is no. <laughs> it hates that. This year I'm taking better care of it and I'm hoping to get this uh, that 30 to 40 spike range. Okay, it always wounds for an air show. So if I air show had gone off in 2021, I would have been calling Mel for some manpower to carry the thing to the show. Okay, but now the giveaway, you all gonna have one to start with, so hopefully three years they'll start to bloom and then they get bigger, they double every year. Okay, we'll see who can grow the biggest Ravenophile script. Okay, no other questions? Thank you. So how many times a day are we watering Oh, Okay, um, the question is how many times am I watering this guy? I designed it and it's potted so that I can choose to water it once a week. It's very water. Um, I would just say uh, uh, it has bulbs and it. it will water drought tolerant, that's the best word. But can you water every day? And that was what I was testing. This plant hates to be over watered, but just in an empty basket hanging, I watered it with these other plants here. So if, if I watered this three times a day, this one got three times. If I water it once, an extra watering, you got an extra watering. Okay? It's one of those things that I always fooling around because my theory is that the plants are drought resistant. What takes it out? So what was taking it out in the past was that I would put it in a plastic, solid plastic pot and it would run out. Okay, so that's no good. I would hang it or put it in an empty pot. And sometimes I was successful and sometimes I was not. Okay, but now I'm paying more attention to the soft buildup in the media. The plants that didn't do well had accumulated so much salts inside the pot that the plant just could not perform after that. So even if you fertilized, it was iffy. If you didn't, it was iffy. It was just sitting in salt. Okay, but when I say salt, is that think of orchids as plants that are very, as a group, quite, um, how do you say, intolerant of having high salt levels, especially in their root zone. So just keep thinking that way and you can easily salt yourself almost any product. Yes? You know when you say you, um, you can grow an orchid in the right sun, do you mean it's totally uncovered? Yes. Yes. And so, am I supposed to move my orchids around or something? Like after, or do something? Okay, well, once this plant, if it's growing in a greenhouse and I took it out in full sunlight, it'll burn. So, usually about this time of the year, or when the days are shorter, I would find a place where this could get one or two hours. And then, a month later, add a couple extra hours. So what I did was I could fully move this huge plant and finally I put it in position in my front yard and it gets it all the way from 11 o'clock to almost uh, 5.30. Full sunlight in a white eye. No burns. So it's something you would have to practice. Yeah. But full like the, uh, uh, the dendrobiums that look like this can take full sun, almost the whole day. You know, the antelope type. That's why people used to like them. They would grow them almost anywhere in the yard. 
But will, will these get spotted? Yes. But are you going to bring it to the meeting? Probably not. So I just leave the, the leaf with the spots. So I, I've been working on that too. So both at home and in my nursery, it looks like when I get the watering right, that the leaves don't have any spots. Yeah, so, and this is with no other adjustments, no spraying. The other thing with um, the reverse osmosis water is the community pots I was selling. Um, they only get fungicided uh, twice a year. So on the day they're planted, they get fungicided. But during the course of one year, maybe two fungicides. In the past, we used to do it every week. So a big difference, 52 versus two. And I'm growing the plants so much better. They're healthier, so like, everything seems to work so much better. I can go on and on with all these benefits of having a healthy uh, plant. I'm performing very well. Okay, so uh, like I have a few pets in my nursery, and I have the one friend from Kate. When I'm walking by, I give them more more than the others. The red, then we're out of time. Okay, he said I'm out of time. Thank you. All right, guys, that's going to be it. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you did, please don't forget to hit that like button. And if you want to see more, please go ahead and subscribe if you haven't already. I would like to say a really big mahalo to Mr. Roy Tokunaga for allowing me to record his very educational speech so that I could share it with all of you. And a big mahalo to Milwaukee for inviting me to the meeting. And the beautiful orchids that you guys are seeing right now and at the beginning of my video were brought in by some of the Orchid Club members for judging. They definitely had some beautiful orchids here tonight. Anyways guys, until the next time, don't forget to always live aloha.